Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it is uh, with great pleasure that uh, uh, I'm uh, meeting with uh, Professor Deirdre Carabine, uh, who has taught for many years in Africa at Uganda Martyrs University and in many other circumstances and situations, and ha but also is one of the great experts on uh, the John Scott to Seriugena who is a great Irish medieval thinker and mystic. And this is the first uh, in a series of podcasts and discussions about the complex uh, universe of uh, Eryugena. So without further ado, I will allow, uh, invite uh, Professor Carabine to take it from here and introduce us to the great Irish thinker. Thank you very much, uh, Adrian. It's uh, very exciting to be the first podcast, I must say. I know there are others there, but um, thank you very much for the, the very kind invitation. So today I want to talk about, perhaps for some, a less well-known early medieval philosopher, the Irishman John, who signed himself Eriugena, which means Irish born. Today we generally refer to him as John Scotus Eriugena. So I'll start by situating his writings and the context of his life. And then I will mention his chief sources and how he was a master of dialectic. And the central part of my talk today discusses how Eriugena broke with the Latin tradition exemplified by Augustine by including God in the concept nature, natura. This move would ultimately have consequences in that a reworked conception of the threefold Neoplatonic schema of mone, proodos, epistrophe, the remaining, the going out and the going back would lead to some interesting conclusions. And I will then explain how creation ex nihilo, out of nothing, is creation ex deo, out of God. How the source of all things is all things and none of the things. And how creation as the manifestation of God is paradoxically God's further concealment. And interestingly, through creation, God creates God's self. And so my main focus today is the concept of theophany. When God emerges from transcendent darkness to become other than God, to become not God in created effects, that is the appearance of that which is hidden. And so God in otherness is cloaked, as I will show, by the particularities of creation and remains always hidden. I'm not so sure we'll have time today to discuss how Eryugena conceives of the opposite movement when the creature goes out of itself to become other than creature, to become God, in a sense, while still remaining creature, nor how the threefold Neoplatonic scheme is actually simultaneous. That will perhaps be a second discussion on Eriugena. First, let us have a look at his con context. The ninth century in the land of saints and scholars saw the beginning of almost 200 years of Viking raids, when abbots and kings fought valiantly to retain what was rightfully theirs from hostile invaders. This century was to be the first of many ecclesiastical disasters in Ireland, as the Norsemen raided and raised churches and monasteries. And right now, it's hard for us to imagine the richness of the culture and learning of the Irish which was centered around these great monasteries. Perhaps the Book of Kells comes close to being a visual representation of its depths because more recent post-Reformation history 
in Ireland is dominated by persecution, poverty, famine, emigration and civil war. And over later centuries, English and Norman invasions finally tore apart the early medieval Christian heritage of the island as the monasteries were finally sacked. Priests were exiled, Catholicism forbidden, and learning went into a radical decline. So looking back, the century in which Eugenia was born was indeed a bleak and bloody time. But at the beginning of the 1800s, good news, a child was born somewhere on the island. Little is known about his life, but he appears to have escaped the ravaged land of his birth. And indeed, by the middle of that century, we find him at the school of the court of Charles the Bald, son of Louis the Pious, and grandson of the great Emperor Charlemagne, who had spearheaded a revival of learning in his kingdom. In the Frankish kingdom of the ninth century, Eugenia joined a cosmopolitan group of scholars dedicated to the pursuit of wisdom and learning based on the study of the scriptures, the fathers of the church, and of course, classical learning, including the trivium and the quadrivium, the trivium being grammar, rhetoric, and dialectic, the quadrivium being arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. So they really were polymaths. So Eriugena was a scholar, but what kind of a scholar was he in the ninth century? First, he was an astute, astute commentator. He was a translator from Greek. He was also a poet, a master of the liberal arts, but most of all, an original thinker who crafted a unique understanding of reality bringing together the theologies of the fathers of the Greek East and the Latin West to forge a philosophy theology that is most Neoplatonic in character. And an often overlooked fact is that Eriugena was most probably familiar with the Irish hexameral tradition. And that brings another dimension to his astute exegetical skills and leads us closer to the position that he began his learning in the land of his birth and continued it among various scholars in France. So what authors did Eugenia read and who were his guides in his scholarly adventures? In the masterful hands of our Irishman, the accounting for all things will generally find itself in the constant intellectual task of ensuring that Augustine and Dionysius, West and East, are reconciled, lest he offend one or other, or indeed ecclesiastical authorities. He was, remember, writing largely in a Latin milieu, perhaps largely unfamiliar with the theologies of the Byzantine world. Of course, we have to remember that an apophatic undertone is present in various degrees in the fathers of the Latin world, and Augustine was no exception. But it was to the works of Dionysius, sometimes called the Areopagite, because he pretended he adopted a pseudonym that he was Actually, the Dionysius referred to in Act 17, verses 22 and following. Gregory of Nyssa, Epiphanius, and Maximus the Confessor were also frequently cited by Eriugena. And in this sense, he appears to have been the first of the Latin scholars of the early medieval period who had such an extensive knowledge of the Byzantine East. And it's not difficult to imagine his enthusiasm and his excitement as he translated more and more of those previously untranslated works 
Nor indeed is it hard to imagine that he had many sleepless nights as he tried to understand how to bring all these sources together, both classical and patristic, Byzantine and Latin, because he wanted to build a big picture of the whole of nature, a bit like a cart cartographer who uses the maps of those who have gone before in order to build a bigger and better and perhaps more accurate map, we shall see. So putting together all these patristic sources together with his mastery of the liberal arts and classical learning, and not forgetting his painstaking uh, scriptural exegesis, this could result in nothing less than a very exciting adventure on the seas of speculative thought. Now, I would like to mention at the start dialectic because it forms the method used by Ariadna, not only the method, but also the very cycle of the whole of creation. If we understand dialectic as being the science of good disputation, that is, it divides and resolves. It divides to understand and it resolves bringing everything back together. And Eriogena was a master. For him, it was natural to separate, to define, to order and to gather together. But putting these skills to work in relation, relation to the whole of reality was quite a bold move. And one that was not attempted again until the 13th century, really, in the great Summa of Thomas Aquinas. So Eriogenes' two primary inspirations in his, his explorations of the deepest matters of reality are the book of nature on the one hand and the book of the scriptures on the other. And his key work, his summa as it were, is a very hefty tome that takes the form of a dialogue between a teacher and a student entitled about nature, the nature, or as it's generally known by its Greek title, Perifusion. It's a remarkable treatise divided into five books in which he attempts to describe, to divide, to analyze and account for everything, everything that is and is not. So that's the world, creation, humanity, its fall and its restoration, and God, the beginning, the middle, and the end of all things. So the underlying theme of the Perifusion is simply nature, natura, a concept that I've noted includes both creator and created. So God is present inside rather than outside or above nature. And this is a departure from the thought of the fathers of the Latin West, specifically Augustine. The first division Eriogena tells us about is into all that is and is not. And it's in his entangling of this distinction that he showcases his analytical skills. At other times, he chooses to focus his attention on the twofold distinction, creating and uncreating, a division, <clears throat> excuse me, that will ultimately be gathered back into one, the uncreated, uncreating. A second twofold way of looking at natura in relation to the creative act is pro odos and dipistrofe, the going out and the return, the going back. It's an important concept, fundamental to the understanding of how Eriogena uses Dionysius, negative theology, which is at root ontological, not simply talk about God. Eriogena also frequently speaks about beginning and, and middle and end, 
but the distinction that he intends to underpin Perifusion is the well-known fourfold dialectical interlocking of created and creating. According to Eriogenes understanding, the whole of reality can be thought of through these four divisions and they're viewed through the lens of the key concept creation. So the first one is that which is not created and which creates God as beginning. That which is created and which creates, we could say the primordial causes, the ideas, the word and the mind of God. That which is created and does not create, that's the whole of sensible reality, including humanity. And finally, that most interesting division, indeed the logical impossibility, that which is not created and does not create. How Eriogena disentangles the four and then gathers them back into one is the focus for the remainder of the five books of Perifusion. So what makes Eriogena different? What exactly is his originality? The first thing I would say is that under the inspiration of Dionysius, often mediated through the Byzantine theologian Maximus the Confessor, the Latin, basically that's a big generalization, but the Latin understanding of reality that is creator and created is substantially transformed. In Perifusion, the two intertwined concepts natures and creation are reshaped within the framework of Dionysian negative theology to form a new perspective of looking on the world. And this results in a sustained and indeed most radical statement of the absolute hiddenness and unknowability of God. So how does a negative theology become a negative ontology? Broadly speaking, in leading his students through a correct understanding of the two theologies, cataphatike and apophatike, positive speech and negative speech, Eriogena concludes as follows. All the significations with which cataphatike clothes the divinity are without fear stripped off it by apophatike. So we can say God is essence, God is not essence. But what if we could say God is more than essence, a sort of hyperphatic way of speaking about God. It is essence, is affirmation, it is not essence, is negation. It is super essential. So we're bringing together both the affirmative and the negative because superficially it lacks the negation, but it's negative in meaning. For that which says it is super essential doesn't say what it is, but what it's not. It says it's not essence, but more than essence. But what is this more than? It doesn't tell us. Essence cannot be said. As Eriogenes' discussion of the 10 categories, the Aristotelian 10 categories, which were a formative part of the liberal arts None of these categories can be applied to God, as Augustine already had stated, and it further consolidates Eriogenes' understanding of apophasis. This context, the non-whatness, as it were, of God, will reveal its importance as Eriogenes proceeds with his magisterial opus. Fundamentally, we can say then that God is not a what. Why? 
because whatness pertains to differentiation in time and place, there's particularities. So particularities can point to the that of something, but not the what of something. And for Eriugena, all usia, all essence, all substance is at root unknowable. And because God has no particularities, nothing can truly be said about the divine nature. We clothe the divine nature in human superlatives, goodness, uh, infinite, etc., etc. All the things that can be said superlatively, we apply to God in order to come to some sort of understanding in our own minds. So what are we saying when we say that God is more than? For a Eugenia, hyperphatic speech will not do. Plus quam bonitas, more than good, is not a negative or a positive. It just points to the fact the general transcendence, the non-what, the not being of God. So where does all this lead us? God cannot really be spoken of then in any truly meaningful way. Eriugena's way out of this impasse is revealed in his very distinctive way of combining the positive and the negative. Having told us that Pluskvam speech is not adequate to refer to the uncreated, all hyperphatic, all Pluskvam speech must be transformed if that is possible. And his solution is found in a remarkable passage in book three of Perifusion. This is what he says, God, by manifesting himself in a marvelous and ineffable manner, creates himself in the creature, apparentis apparitio, occulti manifestatio, the, the becoming known of the hidden, the affirmation of the negation, the comprehension of the incomprehens incomprehensible, the informis forma, the, immeasure, the, the measure of the immeasure, unmeasurable. And, and as this continues, this wonderful dialectic, dialectical passage points up the absolute transcendence of the unknowable God, who at the same time is in some sense within creation. And it's in this way, I think, that the ontological significance of apophasis will become apparent as the lens through which we can view the whole of the divine creative process. In my view, not only my view, this Eriogenian list of apparent oppositions forces the mind into aporias that admit of no resolution. But they leave us in a space that's not entirely unfamiliar. This is quintessential Eriogena, pointing towards without affirming content. This reveals the impetus, impotence sorry, of language. After all, how can words say that which cannot be said? It's a most Plotinian theme. All we can do, says Plotinus in Ennead 6, I think, is simply point to that which is transcendent. And so back to the idea that God is not a what. That God truly is nihil. No thing. 
It's here that we come to a rather thorny issue in theological speculation. Because there can be nothing outside of God, the nihilum of Genesis is nothing other than the divine wisdom, nihil per excellentiam, in which all things are created. Although Eriogenes' progression through the various stages of this discussion is not without its difficulties, in the end, his student proclaims himself, in my view, tentatively satisfied. He says he's, he's stupefied. He's almost lost for words. Having argued then that all things are made from divine nothingness, that creation ex nihilo is really uh, creation ex deo, creation out of God, Eriogena then explains how this divine nothingness shows itself. It becomes itself in something through creation. When God creates, God allows God's self to appear in theophanies, in appearances, moving from the hidden recesses of nature into all created effects. In relation to creation then, one side of the coin, as Eriogen explains it, is theophany, the appearance of God. The other is based on his exegesis of the prologue to the Gospel of John. God speaks the word and in wisdom all things are effected and through him all things are held in existence. In fact, Eriogena says, should the Father cease to speak, creation would also cease. And so God is the continuous principium, medium, and finis. What we find in Eriogena then is not an aspiration to know God, because God does not even know God's self as a what but God knows God's self as incomprehensible in everything. God's descent or manifestation is the unknowable become the knowable unknowable through the particularities that conceal it. It is in theophany then that God comes to be both God and not God. The Russian Orthodox theologian Sergius Bulgakov put it as follows. God is both the who and the what for humankind, the subject of revelation and at the same time its object. This is the conclusion of a Eugenist mini treatise on nothingness in the Perifusion. God both makes all things and is made in all things. Everything is of God. Faci domnia et fit in omnibus et omnia est. For outside God, there's no thing, nothing, no thing. And so it's in this way that we can say that the things that are made clothe, as it were, the nakedness of the continuously newly born God and garments that once more conceal God's nature. For humanity births the divine in a most hidden manner. As Bulgakov notes, not only is the world born, but so too is God. What a remarkable idea. Somewhere else, I explained this a bit like, for those Harry Potter fans, the invisibility cloak that Harry Potter wears to conceal himself from the wicked professor. And out of the corner of his eye, Professor Snape vaguely sees some ripples of the cloak, but nothing he can pin down. And I think we could say that 
God hides in creation in much the same way. The theophanies that we see, the beauty of the whole of creation point to are the ripples of the invisible, unknowable God. Now, Eriugena had already situated his discussion of theophany in book one, where with Maximus Confessor as his guide, he shows how the incomprehensible divine essence becomes comprehensible when joined to the intellectual creature. And in Eriugena, this is not just angelic intellect, but also human. Just as air illuminated by the sun appears to be nothing else but light. So human nature, when it is united with God, is said to be God through and through a totally theocentric conception of the world. Perhaps we could even say sacred, sacred, the sanctification of nature. And in my view, the ramifications of Eriugena's approach, this approach to divine creative acti activity is fascinating. If we can understand an effect as a made cause, we again see a departure from the Augustinian understanding of creation. We're not God. God made us. And indeed, it's a departure from the relationship between creator and created. And while I don't want to stress too much the differences between Augustine and Eriugena, because both of them, in a sense, start within an apophatic framework, I note that Eriugena's response to the at root ineffability and unknowability of God takes a different direction. The Augustinian exegesis of Exodus 3.14, the ego sum qui sum, and indeed the understanding of God as both transcendent and immanent, interior intimu meo et superior sumo meo, in the confessions, is radically transformed by Eriugena. He says, for if the understanding of all things is all things, and it alone understands all things, then it alone is all things, for it encircles all things, and there is nothing within it but what, in so far as it is, is not itself, for it alone truly is. All things then are both eternal and made in the word. And at this point, Eriugena's astonished student exclaims, this was neither heard by me before or many or nearly everyone. We've never heard this. We can almost imagine him stuttering his words here. And this is precisely Eriugena's originality, although it's Dionysian underpinnings are, are obviously apparent. So in this sense, the hidden God was not God before becoming God before creation. An idea that will later find expression in some of Meister Eckhart's German sermons. Eugen says, when he is looked for above all things, he is found in no essence. For as yet, there is no essence. But when he's, he is understood in all things, he is all. When God becomes not God, concealed in revelation as it were, God arrives at nothing but God's own self. Wow. We should not then understand God and the creature as two things distinct from one another, but as one and the same. God is the imminent transcendent who steps out of his transcendence and absoluteness into imminence. 
for both the creature by subsisting is in God and God by manifesting himself in a marvelous and ineffable manner creates himself in the creature. The invisible makes himself visible. Nature then is understood as a sacred veil, a veil that conceals the transcendent God, but a veil that cannot even be peaked underneath, it cannot be lifted through logical reasoning or even careful and diligent, even dialectical probing. So the exteriorization of God is the manifestation of God in theophany. from the most hidden recesses of its nature in which it is unknown even to itself, it is infinite and supernatural and super essential and beyond everything that can be and cannot be understood. And by descending into the principles of all things, as it were, creates itself. The divine essence begins to know itself in something, the unmanifest becomes manifest and created. But while it is manifest, it remains unmanifest. It is in this way that the hidden God draws creation around God to hide the divine reality that can never be seen. Eriogena takes his apophasis to the ontological and absolute limits. God becoming not God, God going out from God is God in otherness, is actually God becoming. God's utterance, God's speaking, of God, God's speech in creation through the word constitutes a distance that never lessens and yet the whole of creation can paradoxically be said to be the creator of God. And so creation is the means of God's becoming, of God's unfolding. God standing outside God's self still remains hidden in the secret recesses of nature until all created effects return through secret channels to the uncreated, uncreating. But until then, God is always in hiding. Through that which is made, God hides in plain sight. How does God then come out of hiding? Or does this happen? How all things return through these secret channels is a discussion for another day. For the moment, thank you. <laughs>